welcome back. We've got uh, Pankaj Pandey also joining us now as well as our chartists and lots to discuss this morning. Uh, Pankaj, uh, let me start off with you. We've got a whole host of action that's building up now when it comes to the broader markets and the small cap index in particular. Within that basket then, what are some of the names or the stocks that have really stood out to you in terms of action, in terms of momentum that we're seeing at the moment? Would they be individual picks or rather thematically that you're looking at the broader markets? So, hi, good morning. I think uh, what we have seen uh, this year is that the broader markets have been relatively doing better. And I think in mid caps and small caps, it is better to sort of look at uh, from a bottom up uh, perspective, uh, largely because uh, in theme wise, you have very uh, few themes which are sort of panning out. I think sugar is one example where most of the stocks are in the mid cap or the small cap domain. And typically, uh, the bigger picture in sugar is that the one uh, near term, you have Brazil, which is where the production is expected to come down by 20 odd percent. That should sort of lead to higher uh, global sugar prices. I think the other bigger picture for sugar is that, uh, see, 85% well, of the uh, sugar company revenues is uh, coming from the sugar segment and 15% from ethanol. And as the blending sort of goes up, uh, you'll see that uh, the overall revenue contribution of ethanol to overall sugar company sales will improve to nearly 30 odd percent. And it's a sort of a more uh, higher ROC kind of a business. And all these uh, sugar companies are trading at uh, mid single digit kind of a multiples and decent amount of deleveraging also on the cards. So that is one thing which uh, can be looked at. Uh, so price performance is already there in some of the names, but uh, our sense is that uh, with uh, a structural change like this, I think uh, you will uh, see further upside there. Then you have, uh, again, in pharma, uh, you have uh, stocks like Kaplan Point, Indoco Remedies, or Advanced Enzyme, which look attractive to us uh, uh, from a bottom-up perspective. And again, for different reasons. Uh, so it's not that uh, there is a common theme uh, there. Similarly, uh, uh, there are uh, pockets like, say, uh, in an energy exchange, which we like, again, uh, power uh, sector as a, as a overall, we really do not uh, chase so much. But I think this uh, company is uh, slightly different from that uh, perspective in the opportunity by where the overall trading of the power uh, will go up uh, because uh, long-term PPS really do not make sense in a world where uh, things are changing so fast. So that way, I think that looks uh, attractive. I think in capital goods, again, uh, uh, so there are some picks which uh, can be looked at, uh, uh, but I think you have commodity concerns. Uh, so, uh, so for example, uh, 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 action construction equipment is something which we like, uh, uh, though the uh, stock hasn't really sort of done so well. But our sense is that uh, typically their demand is largely coming from the crane side, so which is where uh, uh, or cranes are basically used in a lot of uh, infrastructure activities. And as when uh, as and when things sort of normalize, I think uh, uh, companies like this should do well. And I think a lot of the road players are also expected to do well uh, once uh, things sort of normalize in this uh, Q2 onwards, uh, which is what we expect. So I think this year is a year of uh, mid caps and small caps and uh, broader market are senses that uh, will continue to do better than the rest of the pack. Okay, great. Um, GCPL, those are the numbers we're watching out for today, uh, Pankaj. What are your expectations there? We've been discussing, of course, those rising input cost pressures and the impact on margins. But in terms of demand, uh, what are your expectations when it comes to GCPL? So, Godrej consumer, we don't track, uh, but uh, we uh, track Zydus Wellness. And Zydus Wellness uh, came out with pretty good set of numbers. I think this is the only sort of FMCG companies where uh, we haven't seen margin pressure uh, coming up. And... I think, uh, uh, and this is one of the sort of cheapest stocks uh, available in the FMCG universe. Uh, this is available at about 26, 27 times uh, uh, on a forward basis. Uh, previous target for us was about 2,500. And I think uh, for a company like this, we are expecting double digit kind of a top line and bottom line growth uh, margin. We were expecting to be uh, in the range of uh, 21 odd percent. And I think management is uh, pretty confident of uh, even better margins of 22%. So I think in the, in the entire FMCG pack, uh, this is one company up till now where we have seen uh, the company not witnessing margin pressure or they've managed the margin scenario far more better than the rest of the pack. Can you 
the top five stocks as well to watch out for in today's trading session. We will, of course, be keeping an eye out on those earnings. But in addition to that, Chambal Fertilizers came out with their numbers with the revenue from operations at about 16.41 crore rupees. That's lower than the 1969 that they reported last year. But the redeeming factor is that the profits bounced back and how with a 542 crore rupee pat versus about 200 crores last year. Also watch out for HFCL as the profits soared to 86 crores versus 9 crore rupees with consolidated revenues from operations coming in at a healthy 1391 crores versus 663. HSIL, another candidate on the back of numbers, margins expanded to 15.3%. You had the profits growing to 33 crores versus 3.4 crore rupees. Revenues as well coming in at 633 crores. That's higher than the 461 that they reported last year. Ultratech remains on the radar. Brokerages react as Credit Suisse has an outperform with a 7,400 rupee target, saying the strong volume outlook and well, as well as speaking of the pet coke on capacity resumption. Morgan Stanley maintains an overweight with a far more aggressive price target of 8,150, saying that Ultratech is firing on all cylinders. The Q4 results signify a solid underlying demand and ability to gain market share. And into Globe Aviation, you just heard out the details as the company is looking at a fundraise. Uh, this is going to be via the QIP route, close to 3,000 crore rupees. And in their conference call, um, the company has said that um, as of now, they have several options of um, uh, debt financing as well available. And uh, their uh, Q4 FY21 cap uh, capacity um, is expected to be about 75 to 80% of last year. There are your top five stocks. Let's get in a view then, Kunal, as to how you're looking at uh, some of these uh, stocks that had a bit of a rough run yesterday, Midcap IT in particular, CoForge, something like First Source in yesterday's trade, l and Info, they were under a bit of pressure. So, uh, you know, specifically CoForge and l and Infotech, uh, you know, these two names are very interesting because on charts, you know, CoForge was one of those stocks which I think, if I'm not wrong, last week itself there was this big uh, you know candle up move for coforge uh, where it uh, you know jumped up or rose up by i think 15 to 16% odd on a single day and post that we've seen the stock retracing a bit so uh, i think that's largely the kind of performance what this what this last move had last week's move had done for coforge was to try and bring the stock back towards uh, you know its major swing high levels and uh, you know this was at a time when many of these mid cap it stocks were going absolutely berserk where you had mindtree you had coforge uh, you know tata elixir etc which had done exceptionally well but, uh, you know, l and Infotech, on the other hand, I think is a stock which is somehow in the last one month has struggled. And, you know, there has been a clear you know, bout of underperformance into the stock. In fact, uh, you know, at a point where many of these mid-cap IT stocks are still way above their 50-day moving averages uh, and, uh, you know, complete and, and, and far more above their 200-day moving averages, l and Infotech, uh, on one hand, is below its 50-day moving average and is now in, in uh, I would say, very close towards coming back to uh, testing its 200 moving average. So there's this inherent underperformance which is still there for l and Infotech as compared to the other IT stocks. So I would sense that this is very, very stock specific. I think this could be, uh, you know, on, on the back of some events or some news flow, which, is, which could be probably expected for l and Infotech. And if this part of underperformance continues, then I think uh, l and Infotech could drag a bit more as compared to the other mid-cap IT stocks. Okay, fair enough. That's the view coming in on some of those mid-cap IT names. Meantime, uh, Pankaj, let's get in your view on the tremendous rally that we've seen in global commodity prices. What does that translate to by way of your outlook on the metals sector? Um, do you believe that this uh, traction within the metals space is likely to continue? It's been one of the best performing sectors too. Absolutely. I think in the last six months, we have seen the entire metal index sort of doubling. Uh, so, And even in last week, uh, it's, uh, it was up about 10 odd percent. Now, uh, our sense is that uh, uh, overall, if uh, China is not going to produce much, then the uh, elevated levels of uh, uh, constraint on the supply will remain, and which would mean uh, that the prices will remain at elevated levels. And which is structurally very positive for the entire steel players. And uh, we have seen that uh, a significant amount of balance sheet improvement for all the tier uh, one players like JSW, Tata Steel and uh, Sale. And our sense is that um, all these three companies are likely to produce 18 to 19 billion tons of uh, steel uh, domestically in the next uh, in FI22. That should translate into uh, operating uh, uh, a bit of nearly about 45,000 odd crores. 
And while, say, for example, Tata Steel has said that uh, they will be sort of looking to sort of uh, uh, pare down their debt by a billion dollars, but our sense is that they'll be able to pare their uh, debt by significantly by about 30,000 odd crores. Something like sale, uh, I think, uh, can uh, become debt-free over the next uh, one year uh, or uh, 12, 15 odd months. So from that perspective, uh, I think uh, uh, we are not looking at changing the EV multiples, but uh, within the EV, I think as and when the debt uh, significantly, uh, significantly gets reduced, you'll see a far more uh, uh, appreciation in the prices, and which is what is uh, there. So I'll not be surprised if uh, sale or some, uh, uh, touches a previous highs uh, or, in the, or the highs which they touched. Uh, in the previous cycle. So I think this is one uh, particular cycle which is looking attractive. I think there are some pockets which haven't really performed. So our sense is that uh, something like graphite, India, uh, ideally structurally looks better because uh, 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 when you're sort of melting scrap, uh, that's a, a efficient way of uh, producing steel uh, 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 and it's more environmental friendly. So our sense is that with less of global uh, capacity coming up through the BOF route, I think Graphite India uh, relatively hasn't really performed. So uh, our sense is that uh, something like that uh, structurally looks uh, far more positive in a commodity cycle. But overall, commodity uh, cycle looks uh, pretty good. Uh, I think if for Tata Steel, we have a target price of uh, 1500 I think rest will uh, keep revising as and when uh, the results come out. Okay, that's the take coming in on where the medals rally is headed. Uh the one a segment which continues to be in focus is also pharmaceuticals. And given that Cipla, Sun Pharma, Lupin have managed to ink packs for Eli Lilly's COVID drug, there is sure amount of uh, buoyancy in the entire pack. Kunal, where within pharma would you find opportunities to trade afresh and go long? Well, uh, you know, I think we've been highlighting few uh, of the lagards. I think I would, you know, I would say lagards in comparison with the last. 12 month of the rally which you see in the pharma names to try and pick up pace uh, you know so some of the stocks which we've been discussing uh, you know like lupit for example a very very decent uh, you know breakout candidate uh, the stock breaking out of that huge hurdle which was at 1100 1120 zone for the stock for almost 5 6 months uh, you know the stock took resistance at this zone and was unable to break past it and that was at the time where many of these other large cap pharma names had given that breakout. So whether it was Sun Pharma, Dr. Reddy, DV, etc., many of these stocks had broken out in this five, six months period. So I think this underperformance could play catch up for a stock like Lupin, where I believe a 1300 to 1350 could be a potential target. The stock may take some bit of more time to try and you know, reach to those levels uh, because of the certain uh, you know, a uh, burst of momentum and, you know, the inflow of, uh, you know, short-term traders and investors who participate into such kind of, uh, you know, momentum flow. The other stocks which I believe, uh, you know, looks very attractive from a slightly medium-term perspective is Sun Pharma. I think the stock has given a classical signs of breakout. Uh, you know, I was looking at the long-term charts as well for Sun Pharma about at 700 levels where the stock has confirmed, uh, you know, a, a strong series of breakout. Uh, on the short-term aspect, uh, you know, I think, Aisha, I think uh, Dr. Reddy's, etc., they could face a bit of a hurdle. So even though the stock did pretty well yesterday, Dr. Reddy, but I was just looking at the options data and there was a lot of uh, you know evidence for call writing for Dr. Reddy right from the strikes of 5,400 to 5,600 approximately and beyond that as well. So which means that the stock is probably uh, you know, going to face a lot of hurdle to try and break past about those resistances. So I think it could be very, very stock specific for pharma names. And if I have to bet, I'll probably look at the second rung stocks which have been uh, a previous underperformers and they are the ones we could probably catch up and cover up the underperformance with the large cap peers. Right. Okay. The other space which continues to be in focus is also uh, the entire auto pack. Given that dealers are indicating a very slow recovery when it comes to auto sales and what we've seen in terms of uh, the dip on a month-on-month -month basis from Motown for the month of April, given the mini lockdowns as well as curbs and curfews uh, put across the country pretty much. Pankaj, do you think the recovery is also going to be as swift as we saw uh, same time last year or would you think that uh, it's going to be a more gradual one this time around when it comes to auto sales. So in auto, uh, see, auto as a sector is in a sort of a perfect storm. Uh, so one is uh, obviously the commodity prices have been inching up. Uh, steel prices have literally doubled over the last uh, one year. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the vehicle registrations have got impact because in uh, November, December, uh, daily uh, bond uh, data used to suggest about 85,000 kind of for vehicle registration. Now that has sort of come down to about 30,000 odd. 
Now, uh, our sense is that the second half uh, would be a lot more uh, better uh, what we have seen and uh, largely uh, uh, that is where we would expect things to sort of pick up. But uh, I think, uh, so volume recovery is not a big challenge uh, which we expect. But I think uh, uh, once you have to, if you have to sort of pass on this cost, I think that is where the bigger uh, challenge for these uh, companies would lie. Because uh, see, something like Maruti has clearly stated that uh, they would not want to sort of lose uh, volume share. Uh, and uh, uh, so, which is why the pricing, uh, if they have to pass it on, it will be a sort of a solo and gradual process. Which would mean that their earning growth, uh, uh, so volume growth uh, or volume recovery would be there. Uh, and in fact, FI23, we expect a pretty uh, good bump in the overall volumes. But uh, uh, I think uh, the margin recovery or the earning recovery, I think, is uh, still patchy, and which is where the concern lies for the sector. Structurally, we are negative on this uh, sector, but I think within pockets, uh, tractors, and that's a CV cycle looks a lot more better than the rest of the pack. Nuresh, the big concern this time around is that much unlike last year, of course, the factors at play, which Pankaj as well highlighted, that there is a whole lot of input cost pressure because of the steel prices going up for autos. Uh, but the fact that Tier 3 and Tier 4 cities as well have reported COVID cases, the two stocks which actually led the recovery in autos, and they were the more rural-dominated plays, the farm equipment majors, the likes of m and and Escorts. What is your reading on the charts for both those and how they've uh, panned out in the last few months? So, Mahindra and Mahindra has been relatively stable in terms of the fact that the stock has corrected quite a bit from 900, 950 levels towards the 700, 750 mark. But uh, it has some bit of strong supports around the 730 mark, which was the low in February, as well as that was the last breakout point also. So, if it goes below 730, so that is when there could be a bigger correction. But uh, a longer term chart, if we look at it closer to that 650 to 700, is a very strong support area wherein which would be a good place to actually be start uh, dipping into it. So the short term underperformance is given because of the conditions around. But uh, closer to 650, 700 could be a good zone to look into this company with a longer term view. And mind you, the stock has not done much uh, for the last uh, six, seven years. So if we are looking just at the short term part, the change which is happening right now where the market has been excited about their capital allocation, etc., is the fact that the stock used to be at 650 rupees back in 2014, 15, 16, 17. Also, back in 2018-19 also. So, closer to that price point would be interesting opportunity with a longer term view. Uh, Escort, Escorts, at the other hand, is one stock which has outperformed over the last few years in a big, big way. So, the stock, even after the uh, COVID was the first one to actually get into a 52-week high and an all-time high for the whole auto space as such. So, the stock has seen a good correction from 1450 plus levels to 1100, 1200. But relatively, given that the outperformance has been huge uh, over the last, say, 2015 to 2018 period, as well as between 2020 to 21, this will no more be an interesting stock. Uh, we could be seeing a shift over a little longer term time frame towards Mahindra and Mahindra uh, compared to Escorts. So Escorts was a laggard between 2011 to 16. The stock used to be at that 150 mark for a long period of time and then made a move almost to 1,000, and then we've gone to 1,400. So that whole catch-up trade which Escorts has played out might be shifting. So going forward, our view is Mahindra and Mahindra is more exciting for the short term as well as for the long term. So we will be watching out for a trade if we dip to 650, 700 zone for a quick bounce back towards 900 again. Okay. <clears throat> now... Uh Mucomycosis, or the black fungus, a serious uh, fungal infection that's been spreading among COVID patients in India recently. While the central government has declared that there's no big outbreak of the infection just as yet, will the um, instances of this insidious condition rising sharply now during the second wave? We did decide to speak to a couple of experts about it. Uh, Dr. Arvinder Soyan, chairman at Vedanta Liver Institute, mentioned that uh, diabetic patients are more prone to this infection. Listen. In. Physicians saw mucormycosis even last year, but not in such large numbers. Now, what actually are the reasons that it is happening now? It is not directly linked to the virulence of the strain. 
It is linked to the treatment that we give them, the fact that many of the patients have uncontrolled diabetes, the fact that many of them use steroids unnecessarily at home in higher doses than recommended for longer periods than recommended. And there's a common practice, even among some doctors, that when patients are given high-dose steroids, and which means beyond 30, 40 milligrams of uh, Vicelone every day, they tend to carry this treatment on beyond a month or six weeks, trying to taper the patients off steroids slowly. Now, that is completely unnecessary. The patient gets much more steroid than they need. You need to give 10 or 15 days of steroids and then stop suddenly. No patient getting less than three weeks of steroids actually needs tapering doses later. So that's a, that's a misconception. So high dose of steroids, overuse of steroids, uncontrolled diabetes, unnecessary use of IV antibiotics, and unhygienic administration of oxygen therapy, especially at home and in smaller centers. When I say unhygienic oxygen therapy, I mean, you know, the vessels and the water not being clean, the tubes, the masks, the concentrators not being clean. So they must be cleaned. And of course, poor orodental hygiene or somebody has broken teeth or infected teeth, those also predispose to this kind of fungal infection. So when we know the causes that set them off, that sets off this infection. Okay. All right. And, um, you know, in another cross-section of views, we were speaking with uh, Varun and Charandeep at Giri Capital yesterday, talking about uh, the... Uh, IT stocks, the kind of uh, positive uh, momentum they've seen and how the outlook also continues to be robust. Listen in. The top maybe 500 companies, listed companies in India, if you literally pull them out, I think pretty much all of them have had the capital, the kind of people and the technology to be able to use the last one year to, like you said, digitize or survive. So, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, the big guys in India have all been forced to adapt and they're gaining market share, the leaders, so to speak. Uh, the SMEs generally have suffered and have been probably slow to adopt. They have lack of capital. They have issues with, you know, servicing their interest and paying their employees. So, you know, you see this huge divide in India. But, you know, yeah, yeah I would say direct beneficiaries of, uh, of technology are many. If you look at all of India's IT services sector, uh, there are... I mean, it's such a massive profit pool. You leave aside the Infosys, Wipro's, the HCLs, the uh, TCSs, who, you know, combined probably make close to a lack of pro and profit a year. You have a amazing second run of companies in the mid-cap space and a really good set of companies uh, in the small cap and the micro-cap space that are constantly doing stuff directly in the technology space, be it cloud, be it in uh, software as a service, uh, you know, be it in software, you know, be it in... Uh, you know, package software, IT product. Um, you have small companies doing it, uh, work in the area of telecom. There are tons, you know. So I think that this is a sector that, you know, is very evergreen in portfolios. And it has been a performer in India for the last 30 years. It has constantly gone up in, not only in terms of share of the index, but the number of companies that are in the small cap and mid cap index uh, in technology doesn't fail to surprise. All right, getting a move on, some interesting data being sent by Jayesh talking about, uh, you know, the Nifty timeline and where we've seen the biggest drags coming in from stocks. Uh, in the last one month, three stocks have declined over 10% each, Britannia, HCL Technologies and Shri Cements. In the last three months, we've seen six stocks declining over 10% each, with autos being the worst hit. The last six-month period, though, incidentally, there's been one stock that's been the worst performing and that's been reliance industries it's been down nearly 7.6 percent it has definitely slowed down and been an underperformer and in the last year or so only one stock has declined which is about which is nestle down about 5.7 percent uh Nuresh, let's get in your take on reliance industries after uh, the results have been declared uh, the, the stock, uh, what is the trajectory exactly that you're looking at? Will this cool off period continue? And what are we likely to see by way of levels? So we've been watching uh, Reliance Industries uh, very closely for a clear indication which has been missing in terms of print. So for uh, example, if we look at the price point today, we are closer to that 1930 mark, where the price was back in January, February, even in November, back in as uh, back as July also. So we've been in the sideways range. If we look at the price for the last almost six to eight months 
or even more. So in the near term, in the last couple of quarters, we've seen post results. Uh, there is some bit of a, a pre-result uh, momentum which fades off after the results. And that is what has been happening for the last uh, couple of quarters. So what we are right now watching out for is uh, in the interim, we made a low around that 1850 to 1870 mark just uh, in the month of April. Uh, we pulled back towards 2050, which has been a problem zone for the whole of March and April. So watching out for that 1850-1870 mark, also for the last uh, almost uh, six to eight months, 1830 to 1850 is uh, three to five other bottoms. So this 1850-odd area is a very strong support zone. So once uh, uh, we see if that breaks, that would be the time the trend changes. On the upside, we are watching out that 2050, which has been another zone of resistance. So till the time we are in this 200-pointer band, it is very difficult to say what the trend is. And that is the case with uh, uh, some other large heavyweights also. But given that Reliance Industries is the top weight, more than 10% of the Nifty, this could be the decider going forward whether we can change the trend on the Nifty and get out of a range. So watching it closely, as of now, no clear view because there is no clear trend. But whenever that happens above that 2050 or 1850, there would be a good uh, quick 200 to 400 pointer move in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks itself whenever that breakout takes place. So we are closely watching it and waiting it out. Kunal, what about your take on some of those buzzers that, uh, you know, we've seen off late, the likes of Hindustan Copper on the charts, Praj Industries, which has been performing quite well, NMDC as well has been on an upward trajectory. Any comments? Well, yes, uh, you know, I think the commodity space, uh, you know, slash metals, etc. have done uh, exceptionally well. Uh, in fact, I was just looking at the spade of outperformance from the metal names. And uh, I think in the last one, one and a half month, Many of these, uh, you know, second-rung stocks from the metal stocks from the commodity space have done exceptionally well. Hindustan Copper, from being a stock which was just, uh, you know, uh, talking at 110, 120 range for quite some time, has uh, you know risen up by almost 50 to 60 percent in a very short span of time. NMDC, a stock which was considered to be very, very low beta from 140 levels, I think just about a month and a half back. It's come back to 200 plus levels, which it had yesterday. Now, what has happened for many of these, uh, you know, names, uh, you know, Avan, is that many of these stocks have come back into high, very high kind of, uh, you know, indicators on the technical front. So when you when you see RSI levels of 86 and 90 for these kind of stocks, it's very very difficult to try and uh, you know initiate uh, you know a fresh buy into these names because the risk reward in such kind of highly overbought zones becomes extremely extremely skewed now in that aspect uh, you know this this makes sense for guys who have been holding on to these stocks and have bought these stocks at much uh, you know lower levels for them I, I think it's a better strategy to try and have a trailing stop loss and then uh, you know use a, a three day low as i think a, a classic case of a trailing stop loss because i continue to ride the the trend higher but i think from a fresh trading perspective i don't uh, you know since this is a uh, interesting level to try and initiate fresh longs because of the skewed risk reward and the very, very high nature of overbought indicators from the technical side. Let's move on and let's get some more uh, stock trading ideas on that note. Nuresh, what's on your list? So that would be a buy on NTPC with a stop loss at 103 and a target price of 115. The stock has uh, been in a very tight range for the last three, four sessions which broke out over 607 levels. Also, the stock is a defensive play uh, with the current markets as such. And also, we are seeing the PSU basket growing well. So, the CPSC is very close to a 52-week high and has started showing relative outperformance. So, there could be a catch-up trade in the uh, NTPC and power grid. So, we like NTPC at current levels. Uh, we would expect it to first go back towards the previous size of 115. Once that is taken out, we could be looking at a much bigger move. So, a low-risk uh, trade with a good upside in the short term. Right. Kunal, what about uh, fresh strategies from you? Well, in the insurance space has been buzzing quite well. Uh, you know, we were discussing earlier SBI Life as a stock which did exceptionally well. I think even ICC Lombard, uh, I think, is heading towards a very strong and interesting kind of a breakout. The stock, uh, you know, confirming a swing breakout on the daily charts. More importantly, I think it's not just a price-based breakout, but what's interesting is that uh, you know, the stock has come back to, uh, you know, also give an indicator breakout, more of a Bollinger Band breakout on the you know daily chart so this could be a strong trending move for many of the insurance stock uh, i think icci lombard would also participate 
could participate on the upside in the near term. So, would suggest the buy with almost 100 to 110 rupee upside, uh, 1600 as a target, and stop us at 1435. Okay. Let me also <clears throat> let me also go across to uh, Ajay now. He's got some interesting details uh, coming in on uh, Go Air and its IPO. In fact, this is the one sector where we're going to see an IPO after a long time, a very brave time, in fact, for uh, an IPO to be filed in the aviation space when they're seeing the impact of the pandemic and quite severely. Now, Go Air is going to file the DRHP for their IPO this week. That's exclusive to us. Ajay Sharma joining us with all that he's learned about their plans. Ajay? Well, that's correct. Uh, fundraising in the market is back and a lot of uh, QIPs and uh, uh, offerings uh, uh, as far as IPOs are happening. We understand that one such company which is likely to file uh, RHP for an IPO, very interesting one, is going to be Go Air. So Go Air, which is the uh, one of the important uh, uh, domestic aviation companies, is likely to file for a $500 million IPO this week. And uh, we understand that all the papers paperwork has been complete. Uh, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, Vardia Realty uh, is the promoter of Go Air and they are likely to dilute their stake. And almost uh, anywhere between 3,500 to 4,000 crore is the kind of number they are aiming at uh, raising. Uh, we understand that Khetan and company and AZB are the legal advisors on this particular transaction. And uh, if you talk of uh, merchant bankers and lead bankers, uh, it's uh, City, Morgan Stanley and even ICS Security, we understand, is part of this particular transaction. Now, it is also interesting that it comes at a time when a global pandemic is uh, actually uh, hitting the world. Uh, aviation companies are at the bottom of the cycle. So we understand that uh, the initial discussion with the funds of bankers are actually happening uh, and they have actually got a very good uh, uh, feedback of uh, uh, response because uh, you know it's uh, it's very good uh, in investment terms to uh, get into a uh, investment at the bottom of the cycle or when it's going through a rough patch of course uh, the debt reduction is one of the uh, focus areas of this particular fundraiser not only that they're going to order new aircraft uh, uh, as far as uh, expanding their fleet is concerned. They have been doing pretty well. In, in fact, if you look at the last uh, few quarters, you will see that their market share actually gone up or almost 11% now. And not only that, they've added new cities as far as the uh, entire length and breadth of the country is concerned. So this is likely to happen this week. Go Air is all ready to go on the IPO runway. Okay. Pankaj, uh, financials. I want to come back to uh, the big elephant in the room and talk about whether or not we're going to, the likelihood of seeing, uh, you know, a, a delayed impact really of the second wave on financials down the line. So far, we really or, or words of caution, yet earnings have been in line, of course, for the past quarter. But what about going ahead? Are you concerned? Okay, the question is for me. Yes. So, uh, see, what we have seen in uh, overall banking and financial services is uh, obviously the tier one banks haven't seen the kind of asset quality pains, uh, whether uh, if you look at uh, Kotak Bank or Axis Bank. Uh, on a quarter on quarter basis, uh, the gross, pro forma gross NP has come down. And largely, the good part is that the provisioning uh, done by them is uh, pretty aggressive. So, uh, future provisioning requirements uh, do not look affected. Whereas, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, something like Bandhan Bank, where uh, one, uh, the uh, while the gross, uh, pro forma gross NPS sort of come down. But I think uh, what is happening is that uh, uh, in the uh, tier two and uh, tier three towns, uh, the collection efficiency has sort of dipped, and uh, there is a potential challenge in terms of uh, further asset quality concerns. And which is why we have seen uh, a bit of underperformance in uh, some of uh, these names. And I think it is better uh, to sort of uh, stick with uh, tier one financial names. I think one, the asset quality stress is going to be far more lower. Uh, the other thing is the provisioning is already at elevated levels. So that way, uh, profitability uh, is expected to sort of, uh, do well. And I think credit growth is expected to be muted in Q1. Uh, but I think subsequently, we would expect that the credit growth uh, will pick up. And uh, which is where I think all your uh, tier one private banks are uh, far more better placed uh, than the rest of the entire bank. Uh, 
Um, just a short while ago, Pankaj, you heard out my colleague Ajay Sharma talking about an IPO in the aviation sector. The sector is ever so beleaguered at a time like this. And we understand that Goa aims to raise 3,500 crore rupees via the IPO route and uh, that they have seen good initial response between investors and the merchant bankers. They're looking at these proceeds for the debt reduction as well as adding new aircraft, the A30 new aircraft actually. Um, give us a sense as to how you're reading into these very ambitious plans for the company because the management as well, what Ajay flagged off is looking at adding more to a more tier two and three cities as well going forward to their routes. I think aviation is something which we have never been comfortable tracking uh, as an entire pack. Uh, one, uh, largely, I think structurally we still not uh, clear that uh, these uh, slots, whether they'll get optioned in future because that will change the entire dynamics of the sector. The other thing is that uh, recovery in, in a segment like this is again expected to be patchy, uh, especially on the, uh, see, while uh, uh, the leisure travel could uh, pick up, uh, there's no doubt about it, uh, that people would want to travel. But I think business travel would take a knock, uh, sense of that uh, uh, it will not sort of get resumed to the normal levels, uh, and which is where uh, probably the challenge uh, for a, sec a sector like this happens. In addition to that, you have challenges like, say, for example, if you're 40% of the capacity or uh, the traffic movement happens between, say, key uh, uh, destinations like Mumbai and Delhi, I think Mumbai is already constrained for capacity. So from that perspective, I think this one space, uh, uh, I am really not comfortable chase, uh, chasing uh, and uh, not tracking, and neither we plan to sort of cover it. At best, my sense is that it is better to avoid the space. Uh, I understand the, uh, uh, the fundraising requirement by, uh, by the companies. I think media also, uh, space is also sort of witnessing a similar trend. But I think that is one pocket where, uh, which is largely driven by leisure. So I think that is a sort of a better pocket to look at. Okay, that's the take coming in on where the markets may be headed. Just want to revisit what the pre-open rates are looking like, given that the S650 was indicating quite a bit of downside for us. And the pre-open rates are pretty much replicating that. So after that touch-and-go moment with the 15K mark, seems like we're going to be pegged back yet again by almost one odd percent or so after closing in at that 14,992 level, pretty much around that 15K mark. Uh, today, the Nifty Futures could be pegged back. But 14,789 is the print on the pre-open rate for the index. Assuming that we fall in line with the rest of the globe and the Asterix Nifty, which is indicating a 1% downtick for us, do you think this dip is going to get bought or today could be a down day? I think it's going to be interesting, uh, you know, Aisha, because I think there are two parts which I'll probably break up, uh, you know, the market rally. One of them was when the markets went through a corrective phase. Uh, you know, I think the uh, April expiry or the April series, you saw the markets coming back into a grinding range and then uh, the probability of the markets drifting lower were far more higher. What had happened on that occasion was uh, you know, there was a very sharp drop in the open interest start of the May series. I think two days or three days towards the start of the May series and you had seen a sharp reduction almost a 50 to uh, you know 35 to 50 percent reduction on the respective indices nifty and bank nifty happened on the, you know, that occasion now you know typically when you see reduction in open interest and with, when you see a you know a reverse rally on the upside like from 14200 or 300 levels we saw the nifty moving up to 15000 levels that generally should accompany by you know some built up of long positions but we did not see that happening for the nifty uh, and similar was the case with Bank Nifty. In fact, in the last two days, when the pace of rally has sort of intensified for the Nifty as well as for the Bank Nifty, there was just marginal addition of 300, 400 contracts on the uh, index futures. So that itself tells you that you know this is a rally where there is not too much of uh, you know carry forward participation from uh, you know the markets. It's a rally which is more to do with more to do with what's happening intraday. Now, when you're into such kind of a scenario where there is no built up of positions, uh, no carry forward built up of positions, it generally indicates that the markets are moving up on thin volumes. And whenever we've seen that happening, it has resulted into a corrective phase. So, I would sense that uh, you know looking at the structure globally of the global indices, equity indices like Nasdaq, etc. I would sense that this could probably be at least a two to three day correction, if not more. And the probability of the Nifty coming back towards 14,500, uh, 14, 
450, I think this was the low which we tested uh, you know, a couple of weeks back. I think that low should get tested yet again. Looking at the global screen, because things are getting from bad to worse, Japan is seeing a good 3% slide. It's 800 points knocked down for the Japanese Nikkei, which has extended its drop. Now it's seeing the biggest slide uh, since uh, the month of February earlier this year. Similar is the move for China, Hong Kong as well, lower by 2.5%, 1% down for periphery markets like Australia as well as Kospi too. So that really is the kind of slide that you're seeing across the board. Our markets as well should perhaps open in tandem with that with a sharp downtick after just about a touch and go moment with that 15K mark. Actually, we held out on that moment for quite a while. And then towards closing, just eased off a tad bit from there, closing in at 14,984, pretty much around the highs of the day in trade yesterday for the Nifty Futures. The other pocket which continues to hold out besides uh, not just the benchmarks is the small cap. The small cap index has really been raring to go and we've been highlighting as to how a whole host of small caps in yesterday's trade session alone closed an upper circuit were in excess of 4% or higher, most of those, or for that matter, even most of them hitting a fresh 52-week high for themselves. So let's see whether the pain is more in the benchmarks, whether small caps actually uh, show some amount of resilience and whether or not this dip that you're bound to see today on open does that get actually bought into or not that remains to be seen the other pocket which continues to hold out of course is the pses or the psus they've been really uh, notching highs in the last uh, since the last fortnight or so so everything from a bhel bpcl coal india and mdc these are all on our radar the first rates then on your screens uh, this morning uh, you are seeing our markets as well fall in tandem with what uh, the global markets are doing. The fact that Asia has really taken it on the chin this morning and our markets as well pretty much uh, mirroring the same sort of sentiment. Lots of stocks which are going to be in uh, focus today. Uh, you've got a whole host of mid caps especially. Interglobe Aviation after approving uh, that QIP, they're looking to raise about 3,000 odd crore rupees. Uh, after its earnings on Ultratech Cement, Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley remain bullish. HSIL, wherein the Q4 net profit has surged multifold this time around to 33 crore rupees on a year on year basis. Look out for that as well. HFCL, they firmed up their 5G plans. The Q4 net has uh, bumped up all the way to almost 85 odd crore rupees. Or for that matter, even Jumble Fertilizer, wherein the fourth quarter numbers has jumped up twofold. Um, this time around for the quarter gone by. These are a couple of stocks which are going to be in focus. Uh, so there you go. You've got the Nifty Bank sliding by about a percent and a half. The breadth, of course, is two is to one, uh, two being in favor of the declines. The Nifty is down about almost one percent. So after hitting that 15K mark uh, yesterday, we've already knocked off about uh, 200 odd points from those uh, session highs from yesterday. One percent lower for the Sensex as well. Although I must add here that we are not as bad as some of our Asian counterparts. But that said, we've also had a fairly volatile ride. In one week, we've gone uh, almost 700 points on the benchmark Nifty alone. Uh, so taking it with a pinch of salt. Where is the key pressure really coming in from? Like we said, the Nifty Bank is underperforming the benchmark index right now. You've got uh, Nalco, which is the top loser, down about 5% right now. Sale, which hit a 52-week high just in trade uh, last week, 4.5% lower there. Hindalco, NMDC, PNB. So it's metals really which are seeing that sharp slide coming in. Look at Tata Steel as well. Of course, needless to say that in context of how strong the rally in most of these metal majors has been in the last one year, in the last six months, or for that matter, even in the month gone by, this is negligible, the move. But 2.6% lower for Tata Steel as we speak right now. JSW Steel as well is a big loser. 2.6% cut coming in there as well. Uh, some of the specialty chemical names, Deepak Nitride, that also has fallen about one odd percent or so. So clearly, metals are the ones which are dragging us lower. Indusin Bank, ICICI Bank, SBI, Shri Cement, HDFC Bank, private banks clearly come up next. And then autos, Aishar, Maruti, these are all also dragging, Hero Motocop as well. So metals, clearly it's the global trade which is coming off, uh, aligning itself with what's happening globally across uh, majors. 
although uh, for the US markets it was the big tech which actually dragged lower so I just want to quickly revisit what the IT names are up to we're holding out okay I mean uh, less than half a percent cut on imposes is nothing meaningful so to speak uh, Wipro as well is down just about one percent of course it's not an apple to apple compar uh, comparison on what's happening here in Indian IT names and what happened on US overnight but nonetheless you're not seeing any extreme rub off come in there what's resilient then Sun Pharma Coal India, which is holding up 1%, UPL, Cipla is flat, DRL and Nestle as well are flat, Glenmark holding up 1.7%, DHL only moving from strength to strength, the double digit run yesterday and today as well it holds out by about 2%. Uh, you've got a Tata Chemical, which is also holding up in the green. Uh, LIC Housing Finance, HDFC, AMC, these have fallen a lot less than some of the other movers. And Marico as well is holding up by about six tenths of a percent as we speak. Let's welcome on board then and discuss uh, markets further with Nilesh Shah. He joins in on the show right now. Nilesh, hi, good morning. Uh, wondering, Nilesh, what to focus in on, whether it's the new variant which the WHO as well has you know sounded alarm bells against and as to how that could lead to a fresh round of a global pandemic or is it the market resilience which completely seems to be shrugging off all the negative medical news as of today market is discounting that vaccination will eventually overcome this pandemic we have seen successful implementation of vaccination allowing economies to open in US, UK, Israel. Though there are also countries like Chile and Seychelles where despite vaccination cases have remained high. However, 